righty. So let me just make sure that works. All right. So my name is Lena, like I said, and we're going to be diving into, oops, oh, still unbitten people here. Um, all right. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, EcoMaine, um, we are a nonprofit that's located in Portland. Um, we're right on Outer Congress near Unum. If you're driving on 95, you can see us right off the highway there. Um, and so, like I said, we're a nonprofit organization and we're pretty unique in the world of um, waste management companies because we are owned by 20 main municipalities. Um, so those 20 municipalities have um, stake and money invested into our company. Um, they make up our board of directors and they guide what we do um, for the communities that contract with us. So um, as a part of what we do, let's see, um, we provide waste um, management solutions and recycling processes for these 70 main communities. Um, I believe we've added one or two since this map was made, um, but this is just about the right amount, um, the right towns that we have right now. Um, so as you can see, all of these little dots are different colors. We do have different kind of members. Um, we have owner communities, the ones that invest in us, gray of which is one of them. Um, and then we have associate and contract members, which are a little different. Um, and there are about 50 of those. So we have about 70 communities here in Maine. Um, and of those 70 communities, we take care of about a third of Maine's trash. Um, and so that means that we're accepting about 175,000 tons of municipal solid waste annually and about 35,000 tons of recycling annually. Um, so if you were to come to our facility here in Portland, well, not here, I'm in gray right now, but if you were to come to our facility in Portland, you would find our recycling facility where we sort single sort recycling. Um, so this doesn't apply to gray or new Gloucester residents. Um, gray, as you probably know, um, you recycle at your own transfer station. Um, so I'm a gray resident. So we bring our recycling there and they, and you personally sort it out for them and then they bail it up and sell it. Um, we do that too at, um, at EcoMaine, but um, we sort it out for all of our recycling communities. So we do what's called single sort recycling. So at your home, you'd just throw everything into one bin and we'd sort it out for you. Um, so we also have our waste to energy facility, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, that's where we sort, well, not sort, but we process all of our municipal solid waste or our trash. Um, and we do some pretty cool stuff with it to make it into renewable energy and so on. Um, and then of course, as a byproduct of our waste management systems, we have an ash fill, um, which is a part like kind of a landfill, but not really. Um, and so we'll go through that today as well. So um, this is going to provide a little bit of insight here. If you have to move around my picture or something like that, um, I'm going to mention a little bit more about this in a second, but I wanted to give you guys the perspective of how we got to do what we do. Um, so in the seventies, we were formed by four um, communities, just like we are currently owned by different communities, but it was just four and they were actually bailing up raw trash. Um, so we didn't start doing what we do, what we call waste to energy with our trash. Um, until the 80s when we created our waste to energy facility, which was actually one of the first in the US. Um, and in that 10 year time period, we're going to look at um, what happened with the trash and the comparison between um, that time period and where we are today um, in a brief moment here. And then after we created our waste to energy facility in the 80s, about 10 years later in the 90s, we started recycling. And then in 2006, we started single sort recycling and we've been doing just about the same thing ever since. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to show you really quickly what it looks like when we throw raw trash into a landfill. Of course, I think we're pretty familiar with that process. Um, what happens to the waste and why it's important to um, avoid this process. But just in case we weren't familiar, um, a lot of Maine's trash currently is going into landfill raw. Um, and this has a lot of negative benefits for the environment, right? Um, it obviously occupies a lot of land that in Maine we would love to see be left as open space. Um, and when your trash is put into a landfill raw, it's also, of course, decomposing and generating methane gases and a bunch of other um, things that we don't necessarily want in our atmosphere or in our water. 
Um, and by doing what we do with our trash at Ecomain, we're actually putting it into our Asheville chemically inert, which means we're not generating these gases, we're not harming nearby water systems. So there are ways to avoid this. Um, and of course, in addition, when you put raw trash into a landfill, it of course has a lot of smells associated with it. And so as we can see in this picture, um, which I wanna say is um, over at Hatch Hill, um, there are obviously, of course, a lot of what we would call vectors or wildlife that are attracted to the trash as well. And we, of course, don't want our black bears and our eagles and even seagulls eating trash. It's just not good for their systems. It's not meant what they're supposed to do. So um, all of these things, of course, not only create negative impacts on the environment, they also cost a heck of a lot of money. I mean, just about any process to deal with our waste will cost money. But Unfortunately, landfilling raw trash costs a lot of money because it takes up a lot more space than waste to energy does, which we'll go into today. Um, and so it can be really difficult to maintain that, that process because of how much it costs um, in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, right? So we'll kind of expand a little bit on that. And if you guys have any questions at the end, feel free to store them or put them in the comment box and I'll get to them. Um, but this is why I wanted to show you guys our timeline. I wanted to show you our landfill um, or our ash fill. Um, so the gray areas here on this image are our ash fill. So that those are the areas where we've been just putting ash, which is a byproduct of the waste energy process that we'll talk about. The green areas are where we, in that 10 year time span, put raw trash. So the green areas comprise about 10 years um, and four towns worth of raw trash. And on the right, um, in the gray area, that compromises over 30 years of about anywhere from 20 to 70 communities of um, trash in the form of ash. So um, a little bit of a tongue twister there, but there's a huge difference there, of course. Um, of course, they're not exactly the same in size, but you can kind of tell visually that they are very similar in size. Um, and what you can't tell by this diagram is that the green area is actually probably three times in height as the gray area is. Um, the ash actually comprises very little in terms of um, increase in height. And so um, a lot of times you'll see an, a closed landfill that is very round and it's just nice rolling hills. And that's what the green area looks like. Whereas the, the gray Asheville area just looks very, um, it's like a completely flat area. So. Um, there's some vertical there that you can't tell as well. Um, but before we dive right in, I wanted to bring up the waste hierarchy, which is something we use at EcoMain, what Maine DEP uses, and then what we use um, federally with the EPA as well to make decisions around waste management. Of course, we all generate trash every day. Um, and so as a byproduct of our lifestyles, we have this stuff that we have to deal with. Um, and there are a lot of decisions that have to be made when you really are thinking of your personal waste, if you're thinking of your state's worth of waste, and you're thinking of an entire nation's worth of waste. There are really a lot of things that we have to account for um, and decisions that we have to make. And so they kind of created this hierarchy to help decisions be made. So of course, we want to reduce the waste first. So that would look like going to the store and deciding, you know what, I don't need 20 potatoes. I can probably just deal with six um, and get by with that. <clears throat> So you're really cutting it at the source and not taking more than you need. Um, and then of course, before you even throw things out, you have the opportunity to decide to reuse something or to recycle it or to compost it before you put it into your trash can. And then if you are inevitably throwing something into your trash can, you have to decide whether you want to throw it into a landfill raw or if you would like to degree it, um, generate some energy <clears throat> and decrease the amount of size, well, decrease the size of that trash. Um, before it ends up being um, sitting in a, in a landfill or an ash fill for the rest of forever. <laughs> so um, before we jump in, I also wanted to show what trash and recycling look like. Um, I know it can be really confusing recycling as a whole um, and trash as a whole, certainly. So I wanted to dive in really quickly to kind of talk a little bit about what they could look like. Um, and this is different too, like it would probably be different from New Gloucester. I don't know a ton about what you guys do, but different um, 
waste management providers per, um, have different requirements. So it certainly could be different. But anyway, so in your trash would be all of the plastics that can't be recycled. There are quite a few of them. Um, things like six pack rings, straws, potato chip bags, dog food bags, um, anything that's really malleable. Um, so any sort of plastic bag you have, um, those, what we call them space pouches that they put in Amazon boxes when um, you, they don't want your item to move around. Those types of things are trash and not recycling. Um, we have biohazards. So when your dog goes to the bathroom on a walk, um, diapers, any sort of bio, um, like health related biohazard, like needles or prescriptions or what have you, those would all be considered trash. Um, but there are some things that a lot of us throw out that don't necessarily have to go in the trash. And we'd love to, what we call divert them from the trash so that we can maintain more space in our landfill and, and use that very coveted space um, as wisely as possible. And so things that might end up in your trash that could be avoided would be things that somebody else, maybe not you, but um, somebody in your community could get more use out of. This would be something that doesn't necessarily fit your style anymore. Something that maybe is a little broken that somebody else might really want to fix up. Um, something like, for example, I really need a USB cord for my printer. And I know that there are so many people in the greater Portland area that probably have one lying around the house that they never use. And so those types of things um, are really great to divert from your trash and use something like a no buy group. Um, which is a Facebook group that has no um, exchange of finances involved. So you're gifting everything um, from one person to another. Um, that's something that I am working on trying to establish in gray. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I'd love to get you involved. Um, and your new Gloucester too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then you have organic. So things, any, just about anything that's food waste related um, can nine times out of 10 be diverted. I did a program for... Um, GNG adult ed um, a, a few weeks ago about food waste um, and industrial composting. And that was a huge part of it. We were looking at different options for food waste and how to get those diverted out of trash. So if that's something you're interested in, that is actually on our YouTube page. We have an ecoming YouTube that you can check that out at. Um, and then of course, a lot of folks just aren't sure about recyclables um, or they just might not have that option. There are some folks um, or some companies that only will recycle certain things. Like a lot of times there are companies that will only recycle number one and number two plastics, mm. which would be like pull and spring water bottles, milk jugs, laundry detergent jugs, um, those types of things, really common stuff. They won't do anything else, and which would be number three through seven plastics. Um, and so in that case, those might be ending up in the trash too. Um, and so of course, once you get all of that stuff into the trash, your recycle would then look like just cardboard, paper, glass jars, metal cans, and plastic containers. Um, so let's see here. So a lot of times we take um, curbside collection for trash. I know that probably isn't the case for most people in gray, and I'm not quite sure about New Gloucester, but um, if that were to be the case, this is what it would look like. We do have these really fancy trucks nowadays that instead of having a human dangling off the back of the truck and throwing the trash into the truck, they have a robotic arm that picks up the trash can. I know this video is a little bit hard to watch, but it basically picks up the trash can, dumps it into the truck, then opens another door and flips the recycling into the truck as well. It looks very concerning because it looks like your trash and recycling are going into the same container, but they're not. The truck split down the middle. Um, and the operator is able to control things there and um, select which side things go in. I give them a lot of credit because it would give me a headache, but um, it saves lives because dangling off the side of that trash truck is one of the most dangerous jobs you can do in the U.S. today. So um, we are really proud to have that um, technology in and around Portland. Um, it doesn't really extend much into the rural areas, but Scarborough, Portland, South Portland, um, Westbrook all have that technology, which is really awesome. Um, and of course, if your trash isn't going out on your curb, it's probably going to a transfer station or to one of our silver bullet containers. Um, our silver bullet containers are for um, your recycling and those are located typically either at transfer stations, there are some drop off locations that are open to the public or um, at other sort of facilities or municipal departments. Um, and those are great options for bringing your recycling, single sort recycling to us over at Ecomain. So 
we're going to dive right into the tour here. So what we're first going to see is our tipping hall. So I'm going to keep referencing this diagram just so it gives you a little bit of perspective. Um, in normal times, as I like to say, we wouldn't be able to go through this tour in person. And it's kind of um, easier to kind of tell where you are in the grand scheme of things when you're obviously walking through the facility. Um, but I'm going to reference this just so that we don't lose perspective here. Um, so once your trash is picked up on the curb, it then comes to what we call our tipping hall. Um, so we have this huge garage, essentially, um, where all of the municipal and then some personal vehicles drop off their trash. And as you can tell, they can stuff a lot of trash in there. Um, it kind of is like a clown car in a way. It just keeps coming. Um, and then we have a big front loader that drives the trash into those garage bays that you can see in the back. Um, and so <clears throat> you can kind of see the tractor there too. Um, what's great about our facility is that we operate over, under negative pressure. So what you can't see that's in this general area um, is a fan that is about 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, and this fan is constantly pushing air into the facility. And what that's doing is taking all of the smelly air from the trash and actually pushing it into our fires. Um, and so what's re really great about that is not, unless it's really hot um, and the trucks that are dropping off are sitting in our driveway for a while, um, our facility essentially doesn't smell because we're, we're operating under negative pressure. So there's constantly air uh, flowing through our facility. And not only is that smelly air going into the fire, it's also fueling the fire and Ooh, helping us. So it's pretty cool. Um, that aspect of it. And in the winter, at least, you can never smell um, anything. In the summer, it's a little bit um, shaky because things are smelling when they're coming to us. But um, on this tipping hall, we also have the collection for food waste. So um, we have a bunker here that you can't see. That's a little storage area where we dump all the food waste that um, are, is being collected commercially and residentially coming to us um, as well. So just coming back to this diagram, that red circle there, you can see our claws. So where we just dumped off, you can see the trash truck. And then um, the trash is pushed through the garage bays to our storage bunker on the other side, which I'm going to show you right now. Um, so those are the garage bays. You got the trash truck dumping and then the um, front loader pushing the trash through those garage bay doors. Um, you should have seen it just a second ago, but we also have two cranes that operate in this seven story um, trash storage bunker. Um, and so this would video, video was probably taken in the winter um, at this time of year. And during the summer months, we actually are almost at full capacity in this storage bunker, which means we have about seven stories of trash being stored in our facility at any given time. Um, so as you can imagine, that's a lot of freaking trash. Um, and if you were to hang out in this um, area for a while, it probably not necessarily smell, but it just, it's not great. <laughs> um, and so these two claws that we have or cranes that we have going here, one is operating typically um, automatically without any assistance from a human. And then another one is being operated by one of our crane cab operators. Um, and what they're doing is a lot of times they're just picking trash up and dropping it and picking it up and dropping it. And what's that doing is it's taking all the wet waste, which is essentially just like diapers and food waste that folks are throwing out that has a tendency to be really wet and they're aerating it. They're generating air through that system to make it a little bit drier when it goes into the fire, right? Of course, when you put anything wet into a fire, it doesn't burn great. It, kind of, it doesn't necessarily reduce the fire, but it just doesn't help. Um, and so by aerating this trash, especially in the winter when things are already coming to us a little soggy and a little wet, um, it's just allowing a little bit more air to circulate and a little bit um, more drying to happen before it actually hits the fire. So oh, this one is not supposed to have video, um, sorry, audio. Um, so I'm going to play it in a second and you'll be able to hear my boss talking to the crane cab operator. Um, so what you're going to see is the craw claw grabbing some trash, which is about one to two tons of trash into one claw. And so that could be just about a whole load of trash that a trash truck brings us. Um, a lot of those trucks, like I said, are split down the middle and will hold trash and recycling. And so they'll hold about 50, 50, um, of each, and it'll typically be one to two tons of each material. And so this could be uh, an entire neighborhood's worth of trash. It could be a couple mattresses. 
Um, and what they're going to do is dump the trash into these two chutes that go into our boilers, which is where the fire is. Um, and so what you'll notice when I play the video is that the trash moves incredibly slowly. It looks like it's not moving at all, um, but it is. And that's because the rate at which our fires burn is incredibly slowly because we want them to be chemically inert. So essentially um, one piece of trash will probably burn for about four hours. Varies of course, depending on what it is, but that's an estimation that we've been able to generate over the years. Um, and when that happens, um, it basically falls through the fire through a series of grates, but it all starts here. Um, and we'll play this video here. So you can see a lot of things in that load, probably some things that we could recycle, right? I see some cardboard for sure. Um, and another thing to mention too, is that when things are dumped on our tipping hall floor of our waste to energy facility, there is no way for us to divert anything from that process. See it drop here. And you can see it moving really, really slowly. A lot of times they're listening to podcasts or rock music in there. It's, it's a pretty neat place. Um, but like I was saying, we can't sort anything out on the tipping hall floor of our trash. It's actually only staffed by that one guy that's in the tractor. Um, so essentially whatever the trash trucks drop or you take out of your vehicle and put on that tipping hall floor is what gets burned. Um, that's excluding car batteries, which of course could potentially explode or spontaneously combust. Um, propane tanks, fridges, those types of things that we don't necessarily want. We would love to see them go to a facility that actually processes that material, um, which we eventually do, but we of course have to pay as a facility to have that done, um, just like you would have to pay if you brought it to a transfer station. So we'll take those um, items out, those dangerous items and the items that we can't burn or we shouldn't burn because of Freon or gases or what have you. Um, but otherwise everything goes in. So um, as we'll talk a little bit later about emissions, a lot of that has to do with what folks are putting in their trash. You know, if you're throwing out a mercury thermometer, we have very little control over that because we don't sort through trash, um, which I'm sure would be probably on dirtiest jobs because nobody would want to sort through your trash. Um, so, um, now that we get through <clears throat> dropping the trash into the fire, we're going to look a little bit at what the fires look like, and then we'll look at how we generate electricity and the pollution control systems out. Oh, this one too is not supposed to have audio. Um, so we have our fires burning. Like I said, each piece of trash burns for about four hours and at about 2000 degrees. So like I mentioned, depending on how the trash comes to us in terms of temperature um, and a, a lot of other factors, wetness, um, all of those things impact how hot the fire burns and how consistently it burns. Um, but we do operate 365 days a year. These fires are burning just about as long as that, 24-7. Um, we do shut them down twice a year. We have um, two boilers, so two fires going. One shuts down in the spring and the other shuts down in the fall. And just like you would clean out your flu, we use that time to really get into um, these boilers, which are on the right here, um, and do all of the dirty cleaning that we have to do. So really that looks like cleaning out all the ash um, and a lot of the chemicals out of these bunkers. We have over 250 contractors that come in and help us do that. They could be electricians, they could be, um, engineers, a whole bunch of different people come in and out um, during that time, which we're actually just starting next week. Um, and when we're in one of, we call them shutdowns, um, we are burning at half capacity, right? So we have one boiler burning at once. Um, but otherwise we're burning all year um, and these fires never go out unless there's a big issue. So um, there's a lot of buildup that happens and um, there's also a lot of consistency, right? We're burning those fires and we're constantly feeding them. Um, and we also, I'll show you a little bit later, but we do a lot to kind of monitor what goes in at what time to kind of help maintain the levels of that fire. So I'm gonna play this video for you. Sorry if it's a little loud.
So mm -hmm. not a lot happening in this video, of course, but uh, we do have two different windows into our fires, which are pretty cool to watch. Um, in this video, I'm pretty sure you can see like a bed frame and maybe a bit of a bicycle. And uh, all that is to say pretty much the only things that you can actually see burning, um, burning are metal. Um, and that's because they're the only thing that maintain their shape and form at 2000 degrees. So um, we do have and accept things that are metal. We would love to see them get turned um, pre-burned. So before we burn them into scrap metal, which would mean you diverting them from trash and bringing them to a transfer station or a scrap place. Um, but if that's not possible, you can bring it to us. Like I said, we accept mattresses. And so a lot of times it'll just be the springs in there that you see. Um, and all of that metal actually gets mag um, attracted to a magnet we have um, at the end of the facility that we won't see, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, and all of that metal is stored at our Asheville. Um, and we eventually will sell it off um, post burn metal, which is what it's categorized gets very little in terms of income for us. But um, there is a little bit there that we generate from from that metal. Um, and someone did ask how large our facility is. Um, in terms of square footage, I think, I'm trying to remember here, I think it's probably like 15,000 square feet, but don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% positive, um, which includes our ad administration um, facilities, which are also inside of our waste energy facility, not like inside, inside, but they're in the same building. Um, and so that facility is split down the middle part of it is our administration buildings and our offices. And then the other part is our facility. Um, and so a lot of times as a part of maintaining these boilers, we actually explode, um, things in there to kind of clean the ash off in between the, the shutdowns, um, just to get a little bit of the build off, off the side. Um, and when that happens, the whole building shakes. And so we have, um, warnings that go out before, explosions happen just so everybody knows that it's all good. We're not um, in any sort of danger. But um, the other thing to note about the inside of these boilers are the steam tubes that you can see running on the inside here on the picture on the right. Um, so those horizontal lines that you see are all um, steam tubes that are about this big. Um, and that's how we generate electricity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this first. Um, sorry, in a second. But we do push water through these, these tubes. Um, and of course at 2000 degrees, they generate steam pretty quickly um, and flows through those tubes really fast, um, which helps us generate electricity. And then um, we do actually cycle the water through and use it again, um, what we generate, regenerate as it cools down. Um, so this is um, on the left is our um, turbines. So once those steam uh, flows through those tubes, it gets forced through our turbines. Um, and we generate a lot about 15, 14, 14 or 15 megawatts of electricity annually. Um, so what that equates out to is um, electrifying all three of our facilities, our landfill, which has a small office, our um, recycling facility and our waste to energy facility. Um, and then it also powers our two electric vehicles. And in the fall of 2021, 2021, um, it will also power our two electric trash trucks that will have to transport ash from our, um, our facility to our Asheville, which right now is happening with just diesel trucks like you would normally have. Um, but in addition to operating all of those things, it also powers between 10 and 15,000 homes annually. So it's pretty cool. We're able to um, generate this electricity from trash. It is technically renewable energy because, of course, I don't really think that there is a day in sight where none of us will be generating trash. Um, although that is a noble goal to reach for, I don't think that that necessarily is possible for a lot of different reasons. Um, that all is to say that trash is with us for the long haul and to be able to generate electricity and get some benefit out of it is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so once we have the fire, so if we were going through the actual facility right now, you would go through the generator room, um, which is where we have our turbines and then you would go into the control room, um, which is where we have this. Um, so this is one of our control room operators. He's looking at the old steam turbine controls um, and a few of the emission controls, all of those dials are actually pretty outdated. We don't really use those much anymore. Um, but what you can't see behind his head is the new turbine controls. So 
right behind his head is um, a little screen that says how many kilowatt hours we're generating at any given time, how fast the turbines are flowing or spinning or rotating, however you would like to phrase it. Um, and then further behind his head, those black screens are um, the emission controls. And it tells us um, by 30 second intervals what um, our emissions are out of our smokestack. Um, so nine times out of 10, when you're um, passing our facility on 95, you don't see anything coming out of our smokestack. And that's because it's 96% steam. Um, there is essentially hardly any particulate matter in that um, emissions, which means it almost never has any color to it. The only time it does is when um, the temperature is below freezing and the air temperature and the steam temperature are pretty different. And so the steam will present a different color, which is never gray. It's usually just like a white color. Um, but at any rate, we have very precise monitoring of our emissions and we have alarms that go off um, when they raise to a certain level. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do when those um, levels raise. And we of course are also in contact with the EPA just about every day um, about these different emission levels to make sure everything's still in control. <laughs> um, and so in addition behind, you can see like what looks like TV or computer screens. Um, a couple of those are thermal imaging cameras, which I mentioned a little bit. Um, so we have a couple that point onto the tipping hall floor and then a couple that point into that storage bunker where all of the trash is hanging out. Um, and like this guy is doing on the radio right now, he's actually in communication with the um, crane cab, which is where they're picking up the trash. And he'll direct him to an area um, that looks pretty good in terms of temperature on the thermal imaging cameras. Um, so he'll they'll tell him if the fire has gone down in temperature because they just added a wet load of material to add some dry stuff, maybe some cardboard that ended up in the trash or um, we accept small like four foot pieces of wood. They'll add that material into um, the trash, sorry, into the fires just to help it burn a little bit hotter once you add a, a wet load in. Um, so that some of that in there. And it also of course helps us um, notice if there is any fires that break out on the tipping hall floor or in the trash bunker, which as you can imagine with the amount of trash that we store would be a huge issue. Um, even though we burn trash, we don't want any trash burning where we don't have the um, capacity to maintain the fire um, and, contain, and contain the fire. Um, so they also are looking for spontaneous combustion of the trash, which would typically be like a lithium ion or a car battery um, being run over by the tractor, which would spontaneously combust and all of that. Um, so what's pretty cool about the control room is we also have um, remote controlled fire cannons, which would help us um, to mitigate a fire if it were to break out um, before the fire department came. Because of course, if a fire were to break out, it would go up pretty quick. Um, so it would just help us maintain our facilities if that were to happen. Um, and in addition on those um, cameras behind over there, we also have, it's like a, the biggest and most complex diagram that I've ever seen. Um, it is very much an engineer's diagram and it shows um, essentially every moving part of the facility and how that part is functioning. It's of course in different units because each um, different process is happening at different rates. It tells you how fast the ash is coming out. It tells you how fast the trash is moving in, um, how much trash is flowing through the facility at what rate, um, how hot it's burning out. It, it is very detailed and very confusing to look at, but it's a lot of precise information that is needed to help maintain the facility and know when um, a particular part might not be, be working right. Of course, when you're burning at 2000 degrees, you may need to make sure that everything is functioning as highly as possible. So that helps us maintain that um, for the long haul, for sure. And so, like I said, we do have things that come out of our smokestack, right? Um, but there are a lot of different controls that we have in place to make sure that um, what does come out of our um, smokestack is as little as possible. So like I mentioned, we have about 96% water vapor coming out. Um, and there are some flue gases out there as well. Um, but the EPA gives us a certain amount of what we're allowed to produce. And we, of course, are always a lot lower than that, um, or else we wouldn't be operational. But essentially what happens, so say you throw in a mercury thermometer into your trash and 
it ends up in our fires. Of course, that's a relatively small amount of mercury. So just imagine it were to be noticeable, um, which a small amount of mercury is noticeable. So it's a relatively good example. But um, when that starts to get registering onto our um, those panels that show different um, pollution controls, we then are able to trigger a response to that control. So essentially what happens um, is when mercury gets registered onto that screen, we then use um, almost like the fire cannon situation. And we spray a certain material onto that mercury in the fire, um, basically to neutralize it. So it's a lot like that um, acid and base reaction that you go over in high school chemistry. But if we have an acid in the fire, we spray a base onto it and we neutralize it. Um, and this of course is not removing the mercury or the acid or the base, um, it is very much not doing that. The mercury is still present, but what happens is we have a neutralizing material that isolates that into the ash. Um, and so that is our goal at the very end of the day is to isolate all of the bad stuff into the ash. Um, and so what that means is instead of having it come out of our smokestack, we have it in the ash and we know that that ash has really nasty stuff in it and we just don't wanna roll in it. Um, we don't want it anywhere near humans. We don't really want it on our clothes. We definitely don't want to touch it. Um, and we want to make it as contained as possible once it gets to the ash fill. So large scheme of things, there's really, you can of course go into the fire and scoop up the mercury thermometer and wring that out of there. Um, at that stage of the game, that's really all you can do is isolate it into the fire. But that of course is our goal. Um, and that goes for things like nitrogen oxide. We then would use urea um, or urea, <laughs> depending on who you ask, uh, to neutralize that or to mitigate that issue. Um, and then sulfuric acid or really any other acid we would use as lime slurry to neutralize that. Um, and so in addition to that, all those nasty chemicals, we also have particulate matter to deal with. Um, so just like if you were to have a campfire outside, there are little pieces of ash that come off into the air um, that happens in our facility just at a very higher and more frequent rate. And we call that fly ash because it flies around in the air. Um, and so what we do with that material, um, which is located on this diagram as number four, is we have our particulate removal system. And it essentially is curtains that are very, very large, um, probably 10 feet by 10 feet again, or a little bit larger. And they are very, very, very fine mesh. Um, and we have six of them in a row with a little bit of space in between them. And um, the steam and air that's coming out of the fire flows through these curtains. And as soon as the particulate matter or the fly ash hits those curtains, it falls down. Um, it can't fly through because it's too um, small of a mesh. And so if it were to fly through that first um, curtain, it would go through the second. And then if it were to get through the second, it would go through the third. And hopefully by the time it gets to the sixth one, it has already hit down. And what actually happens to those um, pieces of ash is it goes and drops back into the fire. So we're taking that ash that's flying out of the fire, flowing it through these curtains and making it drop back down. So that's how we're able to get all of that particulate matter out of our smoke or steam. Um, and we're able to make that really clean um, steam that's coming out of our, our stacks there. Um, this is pretty standard technology. Um, and I don't think I've mentioned this, but waste to energy is actually very widespread in Europe and has been for a while now. Um, and it's also pretty widespread in Canada as well. So this technology is not by any means new um, and is mitigated in a lot of places where um, the space for landfills and particularly raw trash landfills is very few and far between. And so in Europe, especially, as you can imagine, um, this technology is really critical because it allows the trash to take up less space. Again, this was not supposed to have audio, um, but at any rate, um, we'll be able to see the ash flowing out of the facility here. Um, and I wanted to be able to show you this on the right here. We have a compar comparison of what a load of trash looks like. So this would be, um, for example, one route um, trash truck route of trash. I believe this is Portland's trash. You can, um, if you know trash, you know the, the purple bags come from Portland. Um, but this would be one route. Um, so one neighborhood or one community in a certain city or town. Um, and this is how much ash comes out of that. 
Um, so it's about a 10% of what the original mass was. Um, so there's about a 90% reduction in size and mass um, during the process of combustion. And like I mentioned before, this material is completely chemically inert, which means that there's no methane that comes out of our Asheville. And there's also no vectors um, or smells um, that could be harmful to wildlife, that could be harmful to humans. Um, it's essentially just going to sit there and it's probably really chemical, chemically um, contaminated matter for ever, hopefully. Um, and so what happens once it gets to the Asheville is um, we have, of course, multiple layers of very thick plastic on the bottom and on the sides. Um, and so it is completely contained. Um, we also have a bunch of processes that we do if we were to get a windstorm. Um, so none of the ash gets flown off into the wind. Um, and the same with rain, we have um, different processes that we put in place to help mitigate that transmission of the material from one place to another um, before the Asheville is closed. Um, so the Asheville is still open and we have um, a little under 20 more years of its use before it is full. Um, and just for reference, our Asheville is located about two, between two and three miles from our facility in Portland. So this ash, when I play the video, um, eventually gets loaded into a truck, which takes a while because there's only a little bit coming out from the conveyor at once. Um, but once the truck is full, it goes over to our Asheville and gets dumped there. Um, and yeah, here, let's see here. So a little loud, but um, as you can see, there's really just metal and then ash coming out the other side. Um, it's not very exciting, but it is good to see a little bit of reference of what that material looks like. Essentially, the only big and solid things that you can see are metals that would have gone through the process. Um, everything else is just ash. Um, so to circle back here, um, like I said, I really don't think that we're going to get rid of our waste. We're probably still going to have it at least for my lifetime. Um, and I think the most important thing to do is to get familiar with your waste. And what I really love about trash, which I do love very much, um, is that it is very much in your control, right? You as a consumer make decisions every single day and probably hundreds of times a day about what you consume. Um, and when you do that, you have a choice to either generate less or more waste nine times out of 10. Um, and so by doing that and by reducing your waste in that way and getting familiar with your waste and really seeing where you're generating the most of it or where you could cut back, um, you're really taking your carbon footprint into your own hands. Um, this for a lot of folks is a lot more accessible than getting solar panels on their house or commuting by bike to work. Those things are not possible for everyone. I completely understand while they're great um, trash, I think personally, is just, it's there for everyone and you have the opportunity to remove that, um, or reduce it by any means and really make an impact. And so, like I said, we have a couple different ways we can do that. You can do that through composting and digestion, um, which are great ways to make sure that none of your food waste ends up in your trash. Um, which I have been able to, to participate in because I work at EcoMain. Um, and I must say that I use one trash bag for about a month or a month and a half, and it doesn't smell, which is wonderful because there's nothing rotting in my trash, right? Um, and then we have recyclables, of course. We want to be recycling as much as possible with the big, huge asterisk of not wish cycling, which means just throwing anything that you really want to be recyclable into your recycling bin, right? We really have to be committed to recycling right and making sure that everything that's going into our recycling bin is in fact recyclable, which I must say is very easy and gray because you as the person has to actually sort that out and see which category it fits in when it goes to the transfer station. And there typically is someone there to say, no, 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 that's not, that doesn't apply here. That's not recyclable or what have you. Um, in other places where you're just throwing it into your curbside bin, it can be a lot more difficult to make those decisions and figure out um, which is recyclable and which is not, which is why we have um, tools like Recyclopedia, Gray has their own, and then Ecomain has one too, if you were to have larger questions about what is more recyclable or less recyclable or what have you. Um, and then of course we have like the no buy groups and donations and giving and um, selling things like I mentioned earlier. Um, so I would more than welcome you all to do a waste audit, which 
although it's a little colder now, it might not be as fun to do outside, but I did one in the spring. I took a tarp outside and I dumped my trash out and divided the quarters of the, um, the tarp into landfill um, to give, which I didn't actually give because they were smelly, but um, in theory, you could have given them to someone else. Um, compost and digestion, which I was able to actually divert and recycling, which you can clean them up, rinse them off real quick and actually recycle. So um, that would be a really great process to kind of get a little bit more familiar with what's actually in your trash. You could do it with recycle too. Um, and of course, all of that is to say, um, before you even do your trash audit, it's great to be able to pause before you throw anything anywhere, um, whether that be in the trash or recycle the compost and just make sure that there's not another life that you could give that item. Like before I put my, my, um, veggie scraps into the compost, I make broth out of them. That's a really good example of reusing. Um, and I'm sure that there are more, I really, my husband doesn't like it, but I hardly ever throw out plastic bags, either Ziplocs, um, M&M bags, cheap, um, shredded cheese bags. We reuse them hundreds of times before we throw them out. Um, and so that's another example of reusing before you throw out. So there are really, they're all over the place once you really start to look at them. And it's a really great opportunity um, to kind of create a good questioning um, before we actually throw things out because nine times out of 10, there is another option for those items. So. Uh, if you were to have any other questions, like I said, we have a recyclopedia, which doesn't just tell you what you can recycle. It also tells you whether something is hazardous waste or just trash or could be composted or what have you. Um, and then we have a few tips for plastics, which tend to give people the most trouble. Um, if you're not sure if it could be recycled or not, it really has to have that um, recycling symbol on, typically it's on the bottom of the item. Um, it should be a container, which means that it has a lid um, and holds, th holds things, of course. Um, and then it shouldn't be easily crushable. Poland Springs bottle wouldn't necessarily qualify as easily crushable. That's still a rigid plastic. Um, but when we talk about easily crushable, we're basically just eliminating plastic bags. So those are what we prescribe for folks that aren't sure about plastics. And then if you're really not sure, you can go to our recyclopedia. Um, but I'm gonna take a second here to open up the chat box and see if we have any questions. So, um, yeah, so the um, air-filled, um, we call them space pouches. Um, I think there's another name for them that's escaping me at the moment, but they're those air-filled things that are in, instead of packing peanuts, basically are in boxes nowadays. Um, those have the recycling symbol on them and they can be brought back with your Hannaford bags. Um, to a grocery store typically, or like a Walmart, a Home Depot, a Lowe's. Um, in Maine, it's actually mandated that if a store is going to give out plastic bags like that, they have to have a receptacle to accept them. So if you go to a Hannaford, Lowe's, Home Depot, any of those big box stores, and you know that they obviously are giving out those bags, um, and you don't see one of the receptacles, you can say, hi, I have my plastic bags, I'd like to return them. Um, and I'm pretty sure all of the COVID restrictions with that process have ended. Um, but yes, the short answer is long. I'm pretty sure they want you to take the air out. Um, but otherwise those are fine to recycle there as our Amazon mailers, the bubble mailers, as long as they aren't the paper ones, the manila ones on the outside are not recyclable at all because they're a mixture of paper and plastic. Um, but yeah, if you have any other recycling questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I know there's a lot of really nitty gritty particular items that come up. Um, so joining EcoMain, um, we of course have contracts. So typically um, your town will be ending its contract with another company. Um, typically it's because the contract has expired um, and you can e either reach out to us. Um, and we also have a person that works as business development or basically working with municipalities to generate contracts. And she kind of tries to keep track of local contracts that are going out to bid. Um, and then through that process, you can, we can go in negotiations and we'll submit an RFP and all that, um, um, all that nitty gritty information of actually going through. Um, so that's how a town signs on with us. And then once they do, we throw a party at your transfer station or at another local place in the community, which is really fun. Um, and it kind of goes from there. Um, but if you were to be more interested in getting your recycling to us or your trash to us, 
Um, there are ways that you can do that. Like I said, you can bring your trash to us at Ecomain if you wanted to. Um, there, we do have a fee, but nine times out of 10, it probably would just be the minimum of $5. Um, and then we also have recycling, <laughs> recycling receptacles, those silver bullets that are actually in this picture here that are usually painted in really pretty colors um, that are located at different drop-off locations. Um, for example, there's one in Portland at Riverside Recycles. There's a, a few others that if you really wanted your recycling to come to us that you could get it there if you wanted to. So um, yeah, are there any other questions? So the pandemic has been really interesting. Um, all of the silver bullets are actually not pandemic related. Um, the silver bullets have, um, the person asked why the silver bullets have disappeared or if that's pandemic related, and it actually is not. Um, so I won't dive too much into the nitty gritty, but the long and the short of it is that um, we have to charge towns for recycling contamination nowadays. Um, and that's because um, we are no longer allowed to process that contamination, which is basically anything that's not recyclable and give it to the manufacturers. They charge us for including that material. Um, and when that happens, um, we get charged. And so we have to pass those fees onto the towns. Um, so the towns were essentially getting um, a lot of fees, contamination fees, because people were dumping illegally into the silver bullets that weren't um, monitored or basically staffed. Um, and so a lot of towns have reduced their silver bullets to ones that are at a transfer station or a public works department or someplace where people have eyes on them so that they can kind of mitigate any illegal dumping um, and make sure that they're not being charged for anything. Um, folks were putting crazy things like whole rolls of carpet in there, um, samurai swords, live snakes, like just crazy things um, that of course are really dangerous to us and also just not recyclable. So. Um, that was the um, issue with disappearing silver bullets. They are still around though. Um, and then to answer the pandemic question, it's impacted us quite a bit, not necessarily on our ability to process recycling our trash. We never stopped our operations, but we are operating slower because we can't have as many people in one area, of course. So particularly at a recycling facility in rooms where we would have folks, like sometimes eight folks sorting out recyclables, we can only have two. And so we're just processing at a slower rate. Um, and I mean, it doesn't really impact our waste to energy because we don't have a lot of like hands-on contact with the trash, but um, we do, especially during sh shutdown, which is happening soon. Um, we have a lot of outside contractors coming into our facility. Um, and that of course poses risk because we just don't know where they've been. Um, and so that, that too has been an impact, um, but large scale, um, the waste industry as a whole has been hugely impacted. Um, I don't know if you guys notice, but in New York City, I think about 40% of their um, sanitation staff, which is their, their trash and recycling staff got COVID. Um, um, not necessarily from the trash at all, I don't think, um, but from each other basically. And it was a huge impact, um, just that reduction in staff. So um, the in industry as a whole has been impacted, but we luckily have not been, which has been good. I'll just ask my questions out loud if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, you say that uh, for the electricity that you produce, does it go back to the communities that participate in your operations, or does it just go back to the grid and they can they can you know participate according to whatever they pick for their electrical supplier? It does go back into the like infamous grid. Um, so there's very little that we can do in the actually. Um, having any say over to where, over where that goes other than our own facilities. Um, but there are multiple different waste energy facilities in Maine, Perk is one, and then there's another um, as well. And then um, this technology is also pretty widespread throughout New England as a whole. So you never know, your, could, your energy could be coming from a different waste energy facility too. Do you know how much that electricity was worth like last year how much got mm -hmm. sold back to the grid do you know that number by chance i I'm do curious. not i know that we talk about it though so if i could get that information for you because we do talk about it at like staff mm -hmm. meetings and stuff um but i do know that it's gone down um by how much i'm not quite sure but i do remember that being talked about at our last meeting 
do you see anything new on the horizon for options for recycling? Like, is there something that's not being recycled now that you see coming down the pike kind of thing? Like styrofoam, um, I'm not, I know it says it's recyclable, but I don't know of any place, any place that takes it off the top of my head. There so. is like two facilities in the entire US. Um, so like 96% of the styrofoam that's used in the entire US is not recycled. Um, and so that in and of itself, like the actual labeling of materials is just a horrible, horrible thing to have to deal with. Um, and it's so hard because there's new products and new packaging every day. Um, and something that we're actively working on and trying to deal with, um, not necessarily in the positive direction, but just generally is that there are a lot of new compostable materials. Um, so there are compostable straws and typically where we're seeing them most right now is like cold coffee cups that look exactly like um, your number one PET um, plastic cup and they act exactly like it too. And there actually is no um, messaging on the material that says, hey, I'm compostable. Um, and for right now, in the amount that we're receiving them, they are okay to recycle because technically they're number seven um, plastic, but they're a starch the, a mixture of starch and plastic. Um, so just enough plastic polymer to become a plastic basically. Um, and down the line, we see it being an issue because there's just so, especially in the greater Portland area, so many businesses are converting. I mean, heck, Dunkin' Donuts is starting to do um, compostable straws. And so when it's on that mass scale, um, it could be an issue because we essentially get no money for number seven plastics because they aren't really recyclable, especially the starch based plastics. They don't actually go through the melting down process. They basically, of course, because they're meant to compost, they disintegrate. Um, and so that's something that we're watching and trying to really get the message out that be aware as a consumer when something's labeled number seven, it's probably a compostable plastic. And also, if you were to happen to be a small business owner or no one, please um, reach out to us before you choose new products because we are where they end up. Um, and not to go on too much of a tangent, but if you're investing in compostable packaging without investing in composting as a whole and providing that service to your community and to your customers, it, it's, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and so that's something that we're really trying to get out there right now. I don't want to hog all the questions, but I had, <laughs> I had a couple <laughs> yeah. more, but I don't want to, I want to let somebody else talk if they want. Sure. It looks like the floor is yours if you'd like it. <laughs> uh, okay. I do. I'm like you. I, I try to recycle and compost and I create minimal trash. I would say a majority of my trash is the cat litter, mm. the clay cat litter. Do you know of any options for that? Or, I mean, I see the recyclable stuff or the natural stuff, but it's crazy expensive. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to stick with some, I'm kind of cheap too. So I'm trying to, yeah. think of, like, is um, there an option of something? I don't know, it's, you know, the waste factor, but, you know, that's a majority of my trash. Literally. I know. I've looked into this a lot too, because I personally, um, use wood shavings, like, um, horse bedding is what they call it at tractor supply. Um, uh -huh. but, um, there's no like different waste option for that. It can't be composted or anything because it's got like weird stuff in, um, in the actual material itself. And of course in the, the biohazard of it, but, um, I have seen ads for like flushable, um, cat litter, which, I looked into it and it doesn't have great reviews. So I feel like it's probably an up and coming thing, but it might be something someday where you're able to flush it instead of throwing it in the trash, I guess. Yeah. Which I don't know long grand scheme of things, how great, like, would you have to pay more for sewer work? I have no idea, but um, um, yeah, like who's to say, like <laughs> whether it would be better to like put that into your, your, um, your sewer to put that into like a waste of energy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I think too much about these things sometimes. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Are there, are there any options to go back on some of those landfills that have all that trash and dig it up and burn it? 
Um, so like you've got not, those two landfills and you've got your burn stations. Is it worth digging them up and burning them now, or is it too far gone and they're too ecologically, you know, chemically terrible? It's actually interesting because I don't remember what we were doing, but we had to open up our closed landfill and like dig around in there for some sort of maintenance thing a couple of years back, or maybe like 10 years ago or something. And when they did that, they actually noticed that none of it had decomposed at all. Like there was still chicken in a package that looked perfectly pink. There were still chips in a bag that looked perfectly edible. Like uh, everything was still good to go basically. Um, but at our current capacity, we wouldn't be able to manage um, adding more waste to the system. Um, and so basically if there were to be you would essentially have to build a whole waste energy facility just to work on that one process, which I'm not saying out of the is out of the realm of possibility, but they do cost a heck of a lot of money. Um, so I don't necessarily see that coming down the pike. That being said, I know there is currently research being done on whether you can add the ash from our facility to asphalt um, to kind of dilute the asphalt to make roads. Um, that being said, obviously it's not some a material necessarily that we want out in, in, in and around our natural ecosystem. So it's definitely still, um, in process, but I think down the line, they would love to be able to like combine that with concrete or asphalt or those type of like really solid materials that aren't going to erode much over time. Um, and the other interesting thing that's happening right now with landfills that's not decreasing their size in any rate, but it's um, using a brownfield in a new way. Um, and that's happening actively. We're adding a solar array to our closed landfill. Gray is actually in the process of adding one as well to their closed landfill. Um, and so because solar arrays have really interesting impacts on the local ecosystem, just in terms of impacting habitat and um, transition and movement of wildlife, they frequently aren't able to be put up in that size. Um, and so closed landfills, you obviously can't do anything else on top of it. Um, and it's not great habitat anyways, and usually is fenced off at, to begin with. So it typically is a pretty easy option to just put a solar array on top and, and be generating electricity from it, so. Yeah. Is there a national organization for facilities like yours? Like, are you guys part of like a national group when you have like, you know, once a year yes. conferences and stuff like that. And and what, what comes out of those conferences? What are some of the things you've gotten out of those? Um, you know? So yes, it's called SWANA. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that's uh, an acronym of some sort. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of it right now. I am new to this whole industry, so I don't think I'll be able to replicate that for you, but um, solid waste, something or other. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's a national conference that does things like landfills. And so there's a whole Asheville, um, there's Asheville components, regular landfill components. It does recycling, it does municipal solid waste, all of the technology that's in our recycling facility, all of the technology that are on trucks, like that robotic arm. Um, that's a big um, booming area is um, making sure that we're doing things safely. And so increasing the safety and efficiency measures of um, hauling, which is a big industry now. Um, and then another big part of it is communication. So we do a lot of, we of course have three educators um, at Ecomain and that's a huge part of what we do. And that's actually like a new up and coming area of waste management, of course, um, because a lot of folks for a very long time have just thrown things away and not thought about it again. Um, and so educating and being in a communication process with the public about recycling and about trash as a whole has been something that is new. And so a lot of the old guys that are in like the waste management area, that's something entirely new for them. Um, and it's been certainly important with the changes in the recycling markets after China closed its stores, the U.S. recycling and such. We saw a lot of repercussions of that. Um, and it's really increased the need for good communications and good marketing to our um, our consumers, basically, and our customers about what's recyclable and what's not and such. So based on that China comment, where does the plastic go now? Yeah, so prior to um, 
we call it 2018, uh, the market crash, the recycling market crash or national sword. Um, prior to that, Ecomain actually had almost entirely domestic markets because we're not located near China at all. Um, so we, most of our um, recycling, if we were to ship it to China, would be by by like steamship. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Um, it, of course, impacted the Western coast a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but the only thing that we were sending out overseas at that time was paper and we were sending it to like Indonesia. Um, so we weren't really impacted at all. Um, the paper market is really interesting in and of itself. There's very little um, money to be had in the, the market of recycling paper. And so we don't generate any income on that. Um, we actually typically lose money after we um, consider the hauling costs. Um, but um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, so right now, all of our markets are um, are domestic and they it depends on the material. Some of our plastics go to Pennsylvania, others go to Texas. And then I think there are some in the out West. Um, all of our metals go to Pennsylvania and then um, cardboard frequently goes to Quebec um, and paper. Um, paper's up in the air. It still sometimes goes overseas, but most of the time it stays in the US. And we also have a paper plant um, in Maine that is transitioning to accept um, recycled paper at some point. Um, it's still in the works and we're, we're anxiously awaiting because we hope to be the first one in line to get our paper there. Of course, it's, mm -hmm. it's more um, economically sound for us because there's less hauling, but of course, that's also more environmentally friendly because it's closer, so. So what kind of things, like when we buy, what is it, paper board? And a lot of times it says it's made out of recycled paper. Yeah. That is, in, is that where the paper would normally go? Yep. So essentially all cardboard and paper that's recycled gets turned into um, more paper. Um, cardboard is typically um, made out of what we call um, virgin card, uh, virgin paper, virgin fiber, or <laughs> virgin paper. Um, pa like, so cardboard typically goes into making paper towels or um, toilet paper, or um, those like berry cartons, the green, um, the green carton situations that berries will come in, um, or if you go berry picking or something like that, those, um, it doesn't feel, it feels like a, a mixture between like regular cardboard and, and um, paper. Um, I think that's just about it. I mean, we do use newspaper, newsprint gets turned into different things. Newsprint is different entirely um, and typically just gets made into new newsprint because of the um, texture of the paper and such. Um, so there's actually a really good market for newsprint if you want to be in that market. But of course, there's less newsprint to go around. So it doesn't really make sense right. to actually handpick that item out of our paper stream or out of like a really big plant like us. Like Gray, for example, um, diverts and separates all of their newsprint because it makes sense for them. But it wouldn't make sense on our scale. Mm -hmm. Are there any... <laughs> Are there any facilities that would compost the paper? Because paper is compostable, right? Mm, yeah, I think there aren't many facilities like ours that take waste um, and recycling and also compost. Um, so a lot of the anaerobic digestion or the industrial composting is actually on farms um, because they mix um, the food waste with um, cow manure. So of course it's, it's nice to be next to cows to, to not have to transport that material very far. Um, mm -hmm. and so I haven't actually heard of a facility that would be like combined with the two. Um, mm -hmm. so that is to be said, I'm not sure. I actually do know that, um, some facilities and some places will actually reuse paper, but in a different way, like there's um, animal shelters that frequently use newsprint as like animal bedding, or, um, there are a few other ways that folks, like we had somebody from an animal shelter really in need of that recently. And so those types, um, can sometimes be diverted. We've actually had artists try to get our, our paper from us too, and typically newsprint. Um, and so some of those things are great if you have the time, facility, manpower, all of that to actually get those out. Um, we typically don't just because, especially with COVID, because we have um, just fewer staff in and around. So since it costs you to recycle the paper, would mm -hmm. it be worth putting it in the burn process? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, so 
a lot of um, companies that aren't Ecomain that are typically for-profit waste management companies, I won't name drop, but I'm sure you could probably think of a few. Um, okay. um, they, uh, what they recycle fluctuates very much with um, the markets. And so if they're getting less profit from something because they're a for-profit company, they stop recycling it. They don't necessarily communicate that with the consumer, but once they get it at their facility, they just throw it out and landfill it. Um, so because we have different ethos, because we are um, run by a board of directors that is highly moral and ethical, um, and because we are a, um, a 501c3 nonprofit, we have different ethos. And before um, we have, like in the grand scheme of things, we have profit down here and we have um, preventing things from ending up in the landfill up here. Um, and so we have, we wouldn't necessarily do it with paper because um, there are markets for paper. They're not profitable, but there are markets. Um, but if in the grand scheme of things, if we were to stop recycling something, it would be plastics three through seven, which are um, really hard to recycle because they're so rigid, essentially when you recycle plastics, you chop it up into small pieces. And because like those yellow kitty litter containers are so rigid and made to last a long time, they're really hard to chop up into small pieces, um, which basically just means there's more energy, more um, manpower and money needed to make that into something new. And so there's very little markets for that material. And so a lot of places like um, different companies that do recycling in Maine will only accept number one and two plastics because they're the most profitable. Um, and so it's typically those three through seven rigid containers, like for example, the black takeout containers that you get, um, trying to think any sort of five gallon bucket, um, anything that's really rigid and meant to last a long time would otherwise not typically be recyclable, but we, um, we still collect them. We still divert them from the landfill because we think that's the right thing to do. I think that would be a great point to add to your PowerPoint presentation. Yes, I do mention it quite a bit in our recycling facility, um, but that's a good idea to add it. Um, there are definitely opportunities where other um, companies would probably divert, uh, not divert, but um, add some things into the waste stream that don't necessarily need to be there. Um, like but the priority something... discussion that you had a second ago, that would yeah. be great in your PowerPoint. Like profits down here, keeping it out of the landfill, that, that's worth throwing in that PowerPoint because I think that's a, a nice. really good point. You know, I like that, yeah. that fact. And, you know. Yeah, for sure. I'll definitely um, make sure to include that. Um, Positive feedback. Hey, that's a great yeah, idea. <laughs> Yes, for sure. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm done. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you should be able to see this, but I do have contact information here. Um, for us, we have social media, we have phones, and we have email, of course. Um, so if you have any waste questions or like a random recycling question for a particular item or something, um, feel free to email us. We do the dirty work for you. We'll be happy to look it up and see what, um, what the status is on that particular item. So <laughs> I really appreciate you guys coming along with me. Um, and I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Have a great night, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm.